Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to the Preacher's Corner. I'm Pastor Jay, and today we're going to dive into 1 Corinthians chapter number 16, and potentially we'll just finish this chapter off today, as it is the closing of the letter to the, the Corinthian church, at least the first one. There's a lot of interesting and practical things that would be mentioned in this particular section. So we'll go through it, and we'll take a look and see a few things that uh, really catch the eye as understanding the the blessing of being a part of the church. So let's turn to the Lord, ask His blessing in prayer, and then we'll get right into this thing. Father, we are grateful. We ask Thy blessing be upon us. We pray that we finish this letter well, that we hear the words that You had given to Paul to speak, and that we rejoice in those things that we are doing. Lord, is recognizing that these are things that have been given as instruction from you through Paul to tell us. And we'll thank you and praise you for the way in which your spirit brings us to understanding your word that we may be obedient to your cause through the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. All right, guys, 1 Corinthians 16, beginning verse number 1, working to verse number 4, uh, a simple uh, goodbye that is going to come from Paul, as is written. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. And when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gifts to Jerusalem. But if it is fitting that I go also, they will go with me. Now, Interesting point again at this place of the first day of the week, people gathering together to lay something aside. Now, this is not necessarily considered the tithe as it was because the, the information that Paul was given as the orders of the church is that there be a collection for the saints. Back during the times of, of Paul's missionary journeys, as we saw in the book of Acts as well, and in uh, Acts chapter number 3, towards the end of the chapter, for instance, as that those who had abundance were bringing of their abundance and laying it at the apostles' feet. And the purpose behind that abundance being laid at their feet is for those who were lacking anything, their lack could be taken care of by the abundance of the others. So that the wealthy children of God were making a provision for the, the children of God struck by poverty so that all God's children would have a, a basis of equality in, in, in the house. Now, uh, people try to utilize these concepts as saying, well, see, there's socialism in the Bible. Well, see, there's communism in the Bible because there's, there's say, 12 people known as the apostles who are uh, receiving the abundance of the wealthy people and distributing to the, the uh, poverty, the people stuck in poverty, so that everybody receives a blessing. But the difference between socialism and communism and what's happening here in the biblical kingdom is that the, the giving of the abundance is from the will. It's not a tax that is levied upon them by the church. It's not a, a, a law that is established that if you do not give X amount above all the rest of the people, then we'll lock you up, throw you in jail, and throw away the keys. None of the above. The activities that are done through the house of God and by the house of God are, are led by the will of God. These, these believers, these wealthy believers, they understood that, that their wealth certainly could be a blessing to their brethren that that are not as wealthy as they are and that may be hurting, that may be starving, that may not have clothes on their back, shoes on their feet, 
that that just need help because it, it it's not like our modern times where people are crying and and whining about that they that they don't have any money but they're just about every town I've been through and every city I've traveled I see help wanted signs everywhere so nobody wants to go to work, but everybody wants to be taken care of. Well, that's not the same as the biblical times, and that's not the same as a lot of different countries that I've gone to where there is no work to be able to do. There is no work to be able to have. If you don't have a trade, if you don't have a knowledge like, like the Apostle Paul, for instance, in those journeys that he takes as a missionary, in those journeys that he goes to to church plant, to start churches where there isn't one, and, and he's lacking in funds, he goes into that community, and as a tent maker, he, he starts repairing people's tents. He starts working the canvas to build tents and sells the tents. That way he makes some money. But we understand that he has a trade, so this is something that he can support himself while he's on his journey to be able to do. But not everybody had that trade, and especially those who are widows, those who are orphans, or those who who have never been married, they don't have a, a, a source of, of ability or income except for like what would have... Uh, the desperation of what would happen with like a with a Mary Martha's sister, where she had nothing left, so she would sell her own body just to be able to get food to be able to have. So very important for us to realize that that this is this is a reality during these biblical times, and it's a reality in our modern day that the church is meant to take up the mantle of God's cause, God's purpose for for caring for the sheep, right? Where we are to work together to ensure that that our family at our church and that family being the membership of that church that our family at church is taken care of, that people are not lacking in anything, that the body and the greater community is 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 working together and, and and being taken care of so when you see uh things that are happening like this where these collections where these orders are given where these collections are being taken up um you understand that this isn't necessarily the the tithe that you're going to go in and 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 give to the church for the purpose of the continuation of the operations of that church. That's just not the tithe. This is this is things like gathering together coats and gathering together shoes and gathering together clothes and gathering together uh, non-perishable foods, for instance, and and on all of these different things. This this collection that would be gathered together for the saints. So those that don't have can be taken care of now. <laughs> if we follow the biblical model in the caring for the body, those that are wealthy are always going to be able to rejoice in the Lord for the blessings of their abundance because of their abundance, they're, they're going to give. So they're going to be able to praise the Lord and the blessing of their, their abundance. And I firmly believe that as that abundance is given in order to be able to take care of the brethren, that, that those that they'll continue to increase in their abundance. No, it's not prosperity gospel. It's the fact that God knows the hearts of man. If you're going to withhold from God, you're going to face Ananias and Sapphira. If you're going to withhold from God, you're, you're going to face all of the, the kings that, that, that we could read about in the Chronicles or in the Book of the Kings and, and all of these other things, all of these, these mishaps and these destructions and these whole... A uh, kingdom reigns coming apart at the seams because of withholding from God. But if you're going to give, if you're going to do what the Lord has said, and at that, not the totality of, of your possession, but the abundance that you already possess, and that's taking care of the saints, that's taking care of those who, who did not have, who, who had very little, God is going to increase you. 
he's going to increase you. And it doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to increase your wealth, although I believe that's the case as well. It doesn't mean that he's necessarily going, going to increase your wealth. But there's wealth apart from just your finances. There is joy. There is there is excitement. There is a, a, a newfound love and 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 just just there's no word for it in in uh spanish it's this neat word gozo it 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 doesn't really have an english word that can can butt up against it i guess the the closest we've been able to get to to this gozo is 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 like joy but it's something so much more and it can only be expressed by this this concept this word and that's what you get. And that that makes all the difference in the world because there's nothing better than the service of a king. There's nothing better than God. And so you see this collection that is being taken up. And another cool thing that 1 Corinthians 16, 1 will, will show you as it meets up down at the very end of the chapter is, is that while this, this letter had been written to the Corinthian church, the apostle Paul has been traveling through the churches of Galatia. So Paul is actually, uh, from where this particular church is, he's to the Southeast location, uh, traveling through the, the churches of Asia or the churches of, of Galatia before making his way to this particular location as he had said now in verse number two wh when are these things being laid aside so that they can be collected when are the people supposed to be gathering together in order to bring of their their possessions and their things so that when he comes if indeed he's the one that's coming when he comes he may be able to collect all of these things to be able to carry them to to the dispersion of the peoples in needs when it when is that the first day of the week the operation of the church the gatherings of the church the 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 purpose of worship through the church is all the first day of the week so we have this pattern that is established by jesus and it did change certainly it changed we're dealing with a new covenant time not an old covenant time. And in, in Christ, through his resurrection, we have the fulfillment of a new covenant. It doesn't disannul the old covenant. People that gather together on Saturdays as being a Sabbath day is nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing. I mean, it's just a continuation of an honor of a, of a day that the Lord has, has set aside all the way back from the time of creation. Up until the resurrection but it's important for people who maintain the saturday or maintain that that is their sabbath day to understand that we're not committing a crime in in our churches today by gathering together on sunday this is not something that rome put into action this isn't something that that came from catholicism this is something that came from jesus because all the way back in the Gospels, regardless of the Gospel you want to read, all the way back in the Gospels, you're going to see that Jesus met his disciples initially on the first day of the week. Then you're going to see Jesus meeting them again on the first day of the week, all gathered in the upper room. At the first time Jesus came to meet with them, Thomas was not among them. And you see that eight days later, Jesus meets with them again. And Thomas is one of the one of the people among them. And that's where he says, my Lord and my God. Uh, and Jesus chastises the people for saying, you believe only because you see me. He says, how much sweeter is it going to be for those throughout time that, that, that have not seen me yet believe? And that, that includes us today. So all of that was transpiring on the first day of the week. And then, of course, you go through the book of Acts. You're going to find the disciples gathering together on the first day of the week. And then you, you get these letters from the Apostle Paul that are telling us on the first day of the week. Let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Hallelujah. Just get it all together. And, and in other words, Paul is saying, I'm not interested in showing up to your church per, per se and, and having to go through all the, the litany of everything being, being collected at that time. Get it all together so that when I show up, it's ready to go. We could just take it and run, so to speak. 
And he says, when I come, who, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear gift, your gift to Jerusalem. Now, this gets exciting right here because, of course, we understand Jerusalem is, is the, the pastor is James. But the way that Paul is making known the, the outcome of the, the ecclesial pattern and this, by the way, also is established through the book of Acts. Is that the church at Jerusalem is the hub of doctrine. The church at Jerusalem is the hub of, of the collections of the letters that, that would ultimately be gathered together for the churches as the scriptures for them to follow. The the church in Jerusalem is the hub of, of, of Christianity. So that, that Jerusalem would be the place where Antioch would, would come and say, okay, what's going on? What, what are we doing? What new information have we gathered? What, and, and Jerusalem would be sending out letters and sending out doctrinal positions and all of these missionaries that we find, missionaries like Paul, and they, they were going out, but they were pointing all of their, their collections, they were pointing them all back to Jerusalem. And then you find like Acts chapter 15, where, in there, where there's this great dispute of, about Gentiles, there's this great dispute about doctrine. Uh, being those that were were Jews who had converted to Christ, as they see these Gentiles now uh, coming to Christ, th they cannot accept that they that they're not Jews, and so they say, "Well, you've got to be circumcised when you when you uh, come to this faith, and you've got to have this, you've got to do this, you've got to go through a mitzvah, you've got to." You've got to do all of these different things in order to be able to be a Christian because, because our Savior, our Messiah is Jew. So you got to become a Jew. Essentially, you got to proselytize like a Gentile that would, that would go into Orthodox Judaism. They would ha have to do what is called proselytizing into Judaism. They would literally have to surrender everything of their culture, of their being a, a Gentile, they had to have to surrender all of that and, and literally take on everything to be a Jew. And indeed, in some Messianic Jewish circles today, that is still the mindset that you cannot be a Gentile if you're going to be uh, a believer of Messiah. You have to become a Jew. Now, some people say, well, you become, even in Christian churches, by the way, some, some denominations say that when you receive Christ, you become a spiritual Jew. You, you're, you're no longer Gentile. You've become a spiritual Jew. But that's not a reality, actually. That's, that's something that is false because it, a Jew is Jew without a question. And praise the Lord that that we come across Jews because that that is recognition in itself that God has promised that remnant that God has promised uh, to Israel and his promises never failed. God didn't replace Israel with a New Testament church. Not, not even close. God, God has never replaced Israel with anybody because God doesn't divorce like man does. And it's even it's foolish to think that God would would have divorce at all. That's, that's just a foolishness on its face. Hosea's wife Gomer ran off on him more times than you can count, but Hosea never divorced her, never put her away. And at the time that Joseph, in, in for, exa for example, would have every means and right to put his wife away because she was pregnant outside of their marriage, and how did that happen? That Joseph was, was perfectly within his rights to put her away and divorce her. God said, don't you dare. <laughs> you keep that woman. And so we find that God doesn't divorce. Just because Israel is a wretched gomer, 
doesn't mean that God has forsaken her. Doesn't mean that God has left her. So get that out of your head. He didn't replace her with us. We belong to the Son. The church belongs under a new covenant to the Son of God, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. Israel still very much belongs to the Father. Don't, don't confuse the two. And hallelujah for us that as we belong to the Son, that we do not have to uh, disembark from the reality of being a Gentile. All the more we can praise the Lord that he would open up his gift of salvation to us, the Gentiles. We could praise God. And, and it should be that those Jews who have received Jesus as their Messiah, that they should be rejoicing with us because of how God's love has expanded to increase his kingdom to include the Gentiles. So they ought to be praising God that we, we exist and we could be praising God because we exist. And granted, there are some groups of, of Messianic Jews who, who despise the very idea. But the same thing was true during the book of Acts chapter 15. The same thing was true with the Apostle Paul had to go down to Jerusalem. And by the way, go down to Jerusalem to argue the case for Gentiles coming to Christ. And so that the final ruling of the church at Jerusalem was that the Gentiles do not have to uh, participate in all of the rites that make a person Jewish, such as a mitzvah and circumcision and those, those things that would be particular to Judaism on the Orthodox side. It's, they don't have to participate in those things. The only requirements is that they don't eat meats that have been strangled. And there's a couple of other things that are written there, but they're they're reasonable things anyways that doesn't necessarily take us apart from our our being a gentile who we are it just it means that we can be who we are rather jew or gentile we could be who we are in christ and then jesus through the holy spirit living in us can transform us to be what he wants us to be so it's very important to understand in that whole discourse we just talked about that Jerusalem was essentially the hub. Now, I've got to say this, and, and, and it frightens people sometimes, but this is the reality, that in, in parts, the, the church at, at its beginnings was very much the same as what you might find in a Catholic pattern. <clears throat> like the Roman Catholic pattern, or like the Anglican pattern. Now note that I did not say that the church was this. I said that in pattern, in the way that it operated, it was very much the same. Because with Roman Catholicism, you have the Vatican. You have the Vatican at Rome, and in every single Catholic church or parish just because it may not be big enough to be necessarily a Catholic church, but like all here in the countries where you would have a small Catholic parish, it it's, doesn't matter. Everywhere where you have a Catholic parish or, or a church, all over the world, they turn back to the Vatican. They turn back to Rome. And any of the disputations, any of the disagreements, any anything that would be uh, uh, a doubt that would be risen in a particular doctrine from anywhere in the world, all of that has to come back to Rome. And it is given unto the, the cardinals and the bishops and ultimately the position that they have established as a pope to, to wrangle with these disagreements, with these, with these disputations that might exist within the different churches, wherever in the world, it doesn't matter. They're all connected to one hub. And those disputations and those disagreements and all of those things, they would have delegations come in. They would, they would say that they would, they would come to a conclusion of what is the answer or what is the final answer that this core is going to stand for or what they what they are going to claim 
And that will be written down, and that answer is what is also known in the Roman Catholic Church as the canon law. So that when a body has a disagreement concerning Scripture, where the Scripture is written and where it is taught by the priest, and the people listen, and they say, well, wait a minute, if, if this is what the Scripture is saying, but this is what we're doing, isn't that a contradiction? And they, they go between priest and people, and finally they, there is a letter that would be written unto the, the Vatican to say, this is our disagreement, this is what we, you know, what we don't understand. And then it is given unto the, the core of the leadership to, to discuss and decide and, and dis, to say, okay, this is what the Roman Catholic Church is going to do. This is what we're going to follow. And then that decision gets written into a canon law, and that information is sent out to all of the churches all over the world, but is sent to this one particular church. And at that letter... Then the priest will share with the, those on the side of the disagreement and say, this is the, the rule of the church. Now, we say, well, no, 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 we're all autonomous. We're all by ourselves. We're all this, that, and the other. Well, in part, I hate to say it. <laughs> I do. I hate to say it. There are some things about the Bible I just don't want to be true or I don't like, but... Here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 16, there in Acts chapter number 15, and Acts chapter number 3, and a pretty well a good pattern that is shown throughout the book of Acts, this is the way that the church in its existence began. This is the way it began. It wasn't just individual little autonomous churches out there that were doing doing whatever they were doing. They were doing their own thing, and the only connection they had with each other is, a, is an apostle or a missionary that would travel between them here from time to time. It didn't happen that way. All of these different church plants, all of these different things were all connected to the central hub called Jerusalem. They knew where their hub was. They knew who their leadership was. They knew... They knew the missionaries that were coming out and the peoples that were coming to fill the pulpits that, that would take on these churches were being sent from Jerusalem, were being certified by Jerusalem. And so everything worked through Jerusalem. And, and I, again, I, I hate to say it, but that's the pattern that is established in, in the Roman Catholic Church. That is the pattern that is established like with, with the Anglican Church, where you've got the Archbishop of Canterbury, where you have the central hub, and then everything working out of it. And, and in some Pentecostal faith today, I think, like the Assembly of God, you've got this headquarters. And, and, and any disputations of the churches are going to come to this headquarters. This headquarters is going to make a decision. It's going to disseminate out to the churches. Uh, and, and by the way, interestingly enough, uh, well, I'll, I'll pass that by. If, if that caught your ear and you're curious about it, then just ask me later. But... Uh, it has to do with how the, the ministers and how the, the people are taken care of aside from the body of Christ. But needless to say, he says, When I come, in verse 3, Whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gifts to Jerusalem concerning the collection, which he also gave order to the churches of Galatia to do. And that's all going back to Jerusalem, by the way. But if it is fitting that I go also, then they will go with me. Well, praise the Lord. So let's look at his travel plans. He says, I will come to you when I pass through Macedonia, for I'm, I am passing through Macedonia. Okay, well, that's good news. We know which direction he's coming from. And it may be that I will remain or even spend the winter with you. Oh, the church is shaking in their boots now because they just got their butt kicked by Paul. <laughs> and he said, I'm going to hang out with you all winter to make sure things are going smooth. He said that you may send me on my journey whenever, wherever I go. And he says, I do not wish to see you now on the way, but I hope to stay a while with you if the Lord permits. In other words, I don't want to just pass through and not be able to hang out with you for a bit. I want to be there. And there's a reason behind that is because Paul hasn't been able to spend a lot of time at all in the church at Corinth, except for the bring, you know, lead souls to Christ and bring people together there. But he really hasn't had a chance to be able to dig in 
dig his heels into this particular church to to ensure that it does not go in a wayward pattern from the gospel, which it's proven itself to do because he's having to write these letters. So he really wants to actually get down there into Jerusalem, and he really wants to kind of get, get down in deep and, and really kind of help this church straighten out. He says, but I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. So you know the period of time that that he's going to be uh, waiting before he makes it to to uh, the church at Corinth because he's going through Macedonia. He's going to stop at Ephesus and Pentecost. Now you know the period of time that that will be in his travels because Pentecost. Well, of course you may not know because if you don't know the feast of God, then you don't know the time frames. But Pentecost is also known as Shavuot. It's known as the feast of weeks. This is the middle feast between the, the three spring feasts and the three fall feasts. So you have at the first, between the time frame of March and April, you have the Passover, which is known as Pesach, and then you have Hag Matzot, which is known as the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and you, you have Hag Rishet, which is the Feast of First fruits. Those three feasts are on three days that, that take place in the spring after each other. Then, 50 days later, which is where you get the word penta, is 50, pentecost, which is this point of Shavuot, which is this feast of weeks, is what it's called. And so, 50 days, which established from the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is the middle feast between the three, is you shall have seven weeks of seven days between up to the point of Pentecost, which is 49 days, and the 50th day, which, by the way, the 50th year is a jubilee year. Well, the 50th day is going to be the Feast of Weeks. It is a, it is a jubilee feast, that celebrates the the gleaning of the first fruits of the crops. So you've got a first fruits feast where the the the, the crop just makes a head uh, above the ground, and an offering is made from those crops that just sprouted, just popped up. You say thank you, Lord, for the blessing of the life of the crop that we have, and then fifty days later, you're bringing some of the first of the gleanings of the fruit of that seed you praise the Lord for back at first fruits, and you're lifting that up to the Lord and saying, thank you, Lord, for the grain that you have provided us, and that is the, the Feast of Weeks. So it is known as Pentecost, and of course you know what happens in Acts chapter 2 with Pentecost is that the people receive the, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to go forth and do the work uh, uh, that they are called to do as, as the body of Christ, as the church. It isn't when they get filled with the Holy Spirit. It's when they become empowered by Jesus through the Holy Spirit that already exists in them. Uh, that was done 49 days before when they met Jesus in, in the upper room in John chapter number 20. And he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Ghost. Done deal at that point. But 50 days later, the world knew because there were people from all over the world gathered together at this feast, which is a required feast as pilgrimage to, to Jerusalem. And they were all gathered together, the whole world, and they experienced the power of God through the church at that moment in Acts chapter 2, which was the feast at Pentecost. And so that was the beginnings of the explosion of the church, as Jesus called it to be. So, very important to understand that Pentecost, isn't it? For a great and effective door is open to me, and there are many adversaries. There's always going to be adversaries against the Word of God. There's always going to be. And the biggest adversaries you could ever have towards the Word of God are going to be right there in the church. <laughs> I don't know why. But the world is not as hard an adversary against the truth of God as the church is. Because everybody's got their own opinions. I think that's why. And I think that's why uh, when you look through the book of Acts and you look at the establishment, the way that the church was established, and I, I believe me, I don't like saying this, but 
The very knowledge that God has about man in his, in his self is the very reality that, that to give each body its own autonomous ability to decide whatever it's going to do, and there be two or three in that body who control that body, it's, it's never going to be usable or worth anything. But that you have a central group of people within that particular belief system that says no, uh, Mr. So-and-so, who's a millionaire sitting in your congregation, is not calling the gospel shots. This is what will be teached, and if Junior So-and-so doesn't like it, then he's welcome to leave the faith. But we're not going to bow down to money. We're not going to bow down to wealth. We're not going to bow down to difference of idea lest that difference of idea, of course, can be presented in a manner that would cause us to be able to take a stand on those things and say, yes, this is scriptural, and yes, we can do this. And, and you know, in, a, in, our, in our modern church system, because we've so despised the idea of, of what Rome has done in Roman Catholicism, or we look at Anglican, and we look at these different uh, groups and we say no that's not of god we we want to be independent we want to be autonomous we don't mind having a little association of people where where we might have one guy that that basically gives us pep talks kind of like the regional director is going to give us pep talks and we're going to get together and we're going to do whatever but we don't want one central group of people be the hub of our whole denomination to say, no, this is what we will follow as the church is connected together in this group. But you cannot look at the scriptures and say, well, they were all independent. <laughs> it's just not true. They went to Jerusalem. They sought Jerusalem. They argued their cases as individual churches at Jerusalem. And the final rulings that would come from James, the pastor of the church at Jerusalem, that final ruling went back out to the churches and that's what you were going to accept. That's what you were going to do. Interesting, isn't it? And he says, Therefore, let no one despise him. Oh, let's back up to uh, Timothy. This is exciting. He says, and, and if Tim, Timothy comes, now this is that same Timotheus, and it, I'll explain him in a second. And if Timothy comes, see that he may be with you without fear. <laughs> That's kind of exciting. For he does the work of the Lord as I also do. Therefore, let no one despise him, but send him on his journey in peace, that he may come to me, for I am waiting for him with the brethren. This is kind of a warning that Paul's given to the church at Corinth not to mess with Timothy. Now, keeping in mind, Timothy uh, Timothy was circumcised, but as, we, as we're introduced to Timothy, he's not fully Jewish, right? His mother is Jewish, but his father was a Greek. And so Timothy was circumcised in order to be able to begin working with this, this, these churches as they're starting to be born, because the majority of the membership of the churches as they be, began were, were Jewish. And so for Timothy to be able to have any ability to, to even speak to these people, Paul ensured that, that there would be no disputation against him. So he had him circumcised and, and, and the whole nine yards so that the Jews would see him at least as a proselyte and, and at that point, he would at least be able to come into the congregation. But that doesn't mean that they were going to listen to him. That just means that he was going to be able to come into the congregation. So Paul, preceding Timothy's arrival, is telling these people, you better not shake him up. You better not mess with him. You better leave him alone. And you better not despise him. He's my son in the faith. He's coming to share what I have said to you. He's, he's my servant. So if you mess with him, I'm coming after you. <laughs> I think the Apostle Paul threw a little, uh, a little uh, flair, as it was, on top of that with this letter. Say, you mess with my boy, I'm coming after you. Hallelujah for that. Let no one despise him. Oh, and by the way, he was a young fella. He wasn't like a... a, a uh, a seasoned chap. He's a young fellow. And thus the final instructions. 
Concerning Apollos, remember we, we knew Apollos from the very beginning. He said, rather, you know, I was baptized unto Apollos. So I was baptized unto Paul. Well, he said, concerning Apollos, he said, I strongly urged him to come uh, to you with the brethren, but he was quite unwilling to come at this time. However, when it's convenient for him, he'll show up, which is interesting. Uh, a convenience. We all we always believe, oh, well, if the Lord leads me there, well, the, the Lord is calling me. Well, that's not how they worked in this this time of, of the Old Testament or the New Testament here. It's like, you know what? I can't make it there this time. I'm working. Um, when I get a chance to come, I'll come. <laughs> I think that's cool. He said, watch, stand fast at the faith. Be, be brave. Be strong. Yes, these these courageous attributes of what a church needs to be in our modern day, even in order to be able to take a stand against the wiles and wickedness of a world around us and the governments that be. Maybe we could change them this way. Let all that you do be done with love. Indeed, but don't mistake love for a worldly definition. Understand whom the Lord loves, he chastises. I urge you, brethren, you know the household of Stephanus, which was a cool guy, that is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Amen. As would be said by Jude, addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. That word addicted is in similar tone to this word devoted. That you also submit to such and to everyone who works and labors with us. Submit to what? Those who have devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints. That's who we submit to. Not fair, because as Americans, we submit to no one. And I, I, I shudder to think that we would ever even submit to God. But we're not supposed to be Americans anymore. We're supposed to be Christians, which is a separated people no matter where we live. Interesting. I am glad about the coming of Stephanus Fortuna, Fortunatus and Acacius, for what they what was lacking on your part, they supplied. Good guys took care of Paul, for they refreshed my spirit and yours. How oh, the refreshing of the spirit, praise God. The churches of Asia, that's Galatian churches. The churches of Asia greet you, Aquila and Priscilla, still working from the time Paul got a hold of them, greet you heartily in the Lord with a church that is in their house. Praise the Lord. All the brethren greet you, greet one another with a holy kiss, the salutation with my own hand, Paul's. If, if anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. Amen. <laughs> o oh Lord, come. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. My love be with you all. In Christ Jesus, amen. Love that last little quip as I finish this day. That last little quip. If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. Well, that's not the gospel. And your point, it actually kind of is. If you're not going to love God, then you're going to be separated from him for an eternity. So Paul just puts it right in there. If you don't love God, you're going to be cursed. Done. <laughs> Done. Father, we thank you and praise you, asking your blessing be upon us that we may rejoice this day in the Corinthians that letter that we have just completed. Thank you, Lord, for this knowledge. Thank you, Lord, for another book down. May God bless us richly for our faithfulness in studying your word, line upon line, precept upon precept, in this book and then in that book, as here and, a little, and there. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Keep you guys. Cause his face to shine upon you. And the lights got real bright. Because the sun just rose up here in the West. And so we'll catch you guys uh, Sunday, 1030. If you wish to join us at Martin Baptist Church. And otherwise, we'll see you on Monday. Uh, you know what? We'll probably just carry on through the book of Proverbs. Why not? We got plenty of them left to go. Till then, we'll see you.